Okay, so welcome to the part two video of Zimba. This will be covering, um, I guess, pre-production elements, the initial recordings, and uh, how I prepped everything to send it to Tim, who mixed it, and that will be in the next video. I'm gonna ask Tim some questions. But in this part, um, the workflow for this was, I wrote everything in Sibelius, um, had the parts extracted. I sent parts out to a bunch of different players and kind of as an experiment and um, told them the metro marking and they sent me back things and I just took whatever they did for the first pass. I didn't give them any notes on anything. Um, so they never really heard each other play. There's no 2D elements. They didn't hear anything, which is kind of interesting because 90% um, of it worked very well. The phrasing, the articulations were all agreed upon. Um, and from there, I took things and I had to do some corrections with, uh, with timing and stuff and some automations. But let, let me just show you, this is how I worked to prepare to Tim for to mix it. So this is pretty much what I delivered. So I'll just play a little bit of it. You can see I'm clipping here. I don't have anything on the master bus. Um, pretty much what I was doing here was doing some basic plugins, um, and I also figured out the panning. So on this example, I was listening a lot to some of the old recordings, like they did at Capitol Records, and I made the decision to have the trumpets and the bones on the left, um, hard left. I've been I've been learning about like LCR recording. I'm not an expert, and I'm going to ask Tim some questions, but. I took everything on the bones and the trumpets and bone and pan them to the left. And I took everything on the on the saxes and pan them all the way to the right. And then I think I put the rest of the stuff somewhere down the middle because I couldn't figure out where else to put it. So um, this stuff was pretty much recorded bone dry. I was going to show you what I was delivered. Um, this is this is an example. This is the trumpet one with nothing on it at all. So I took that and, um, like I said, I panned it to the left. Let's see, it doesn't even look like, oh, I bust it and then panned it to the, to the left. I was using um, this awesome plugin by uh, UAD, the EMT-140, and I couldn't get it quite right, but what I did is I fooled around with this enough. I just showed you what I sent to Tim, but when I, when I sent it to Tim, I bypassed the reverb, everything else I kept. But um, let's just hear the trumpet one now with uh, what I had on it. The plate makes all the difference. So I just like don't have enough skills to uh, dial it in the way I want it. I mean, this is the big knob right here, the, uh, the wet dry ratio. So this is an insert reverb as opposed to a send reverb. So the insert will mute some of the dry signal, um, whereas an insert will keep, uh, whereas a send will keep 100% of the dry signal and add the reverb. So I th since this was all, it sounds like that trumpet was recorded very closely, there really was no option. You have to put it in some kind of acoustic space. So um, when I delivered things, I took a screen grab of this for Tim and, um, and sent, and sent that along with my delivery because I know he can, he's way better at me than tuning in that stuff. But um, let's listen to the trumpets without the reverb. So pretty much looks like I added some, I cut some of the bottom off. I did some, uh, did some tape saturation. This is a really good preset I find for all sorts of cinematic stuff on this Ampex 102. The um, ain't that pretty preset. A lot of times when I do tape saturation, I just put this on it and I don't tweak it. I'm not the awesomest tweaker, but I like to use plugins because they're fun to buy and stuff. But uh, that's a really good plugin. So you can check that out if you want. Um, 
The sax is... Let's hear how they sound. The sax player is amazing. So let's turn it without the reverb. I thought he really did a good job recording this. Uh, one guy recorded all of these instruments. So, um, so basic panning, that's probably the first thing I did. Probably got a little bit of a sound. And then I started going in and doing some corrective mixing. So for this, I went to, uh, here's my automations. Um, so I was doing musical things like uh, balancing sections. It looks like I dipped a bunch of clarinet stuff here. Let's listen to what's going on there in the clarinets. So like I boosted that bass clarinet lick quite a bit. Um, so since things were recorded all separately, sometimes you have to compensate. It looks like I took a bunch of the bones down there on this chord in there part, it looks like. Um, uh, here's some global sax moves. So I did some internal sax moves to balance the five, the five chairs and make that sound kind of like what I wanted. And then I added these uh, little rides to the bus. And I bet Tim did more. I haven't looked at what he did yet, but I bet he did more. Uh, looks like I did the same thing with the winds. So I grouped them, did some corrections, did lots of corrections in the oboes. I recorded the oboes myself, and that's why it sounds like shit. I'm not the greatest recordist. Um, I was using, interestingly enough, I've been having this like, uh, I've been having luck with this knockoff Chinese microphone I bought. The um, this little ribbon mic I've been using it on everything. Like I used it on the piano. I recorded the piano myself. My little upright um, in my studio. Let's just hear some of the piano. So it's like I recorded a bunch of things and muted quite a bit more. There's some shit. There's some shitty playing for you. Um. This track I, is a very reduced version of the, uh, the, the chart. So here's the chart. Like, I ended up hardly recording, and well, I didn't record any electric guitar. I recorded some shakers with my little knockoff mic. Let's see. I think they're, oh, they're in the next session. Um, but pretty much what I did here is, another thing I did was, um, offset things with the delay. Just like, this is a great habit to get into with, um, here's the delay in Logic. So this is like an offset. You can, it moves in in milliseconds or ticks to the right or the left. Um, and I think in previous videos, and there's a lot of other videos that talk about this, but offsetting things to the left, um, especially legato samples is really critical, but you can do it with audio too to make things fit in the pocket better. So I, I always find like 30, second, 30 milliseconds to the left is a great number to start off with um, legato samples. But uh, you, can, um, you can experiment moving things. You probably won't hear anything less than 10 because that's really kind of quiet. Uh, in terms of MIDI, I didn't record any. So this, is, this track doesn't have any bass or drum kit. But I did add some cowbell from Cineberg, and I added some uh, MIDI vibes. So, um, and then when I was ready to stem, since I knew Tim would do a much better job with the reverb, I turned off everything, turned off all the reverb and bounced it out. So that's kind of the first step. Um, you want to do corrections to make things sound 2D. If you're working with a mixer, give give him or her a, a, a reference, a demo, unless you unless you totally trust their judgment, and then take off what you did so they can do it. And sometimes some screenshots help. So the next part I did was I bounced it out dry, and um, I wanted to add bass and drums. So. Originally I did record drums for this and I used like a, a, a chart with a lot of slashes on it. 
pretty much the player ad-libbing. And I found that um, his playing was, was awesome and, and very virtuosic, but it was like too much. So I had to like dumb it down. So I programmed all the drums myself um, in this session here. For some reason, I like to have uh, separate sessions when I do stuff like this. So sometimes drum programming, if you know you have a chart that like it doesn't have a lot of revisions or if you're the boss of it, so you don't have a director being like, oh, change this, conform this. I sometimes like to separate things in different sessions. It just helps my workflow. So this was the drum session. Here's the stemmed mix. Um, I didn't put any reverb when I when I got it, so, so I had all the reverb off. I minus eight it decibels to give me some room to work. Um, the bass. Looks like we just used a uh, I think a pick up or a small condenser mic, I mean a condenser mic on, on the bass guy. And then um, one of my old favorite libraries from, from us is the Session Drummer series and I used a lot of it here to do all the drums. So I programmed all these drums using that. Um, this Logic Kit Crash is like one of the default Studio Tight Kit it looks like that I was using because um, I really wanted like an extra crash symbol and uh, and Session Drummer Series was using a, a medium to small kit so I had to add, that's a freebie. And then I used a few of our freebies from um, the Cine Samples website. You can go on and check. We have some freebies up there. The triangle is pretty pretty good. Um, this is the Cine Samples free triangle. And um, the free snaps and claps patch. Which is pretty cool. I use it, I use it on occasion still. It's an older patch, but it still is pretty decent. And um, I recorded some shaker here in my studio with, um, this is how I do shaker, because I'm not good enough to keep the groove going, so I have to do these little things and correct them and then drag and drop them. So I just did that with my little ribbon mic and uh, I have a little tambourine. It's kind of worth going to the guitar center or something and getting some of these smaller instruments to have in your studio because sometimes programming a uh, shaker it can be difficult because it's hard to sample. If you imagine, if you move your hand to the left or right, it gives away of its sound. So the shaker is like an instrument that relies upon movement. So I highly recommend you know, spending like a hundred dollars getting yourself a little percussion kit to uh, to add these little parts in. But the tam like the tambourine and the um, and the shaker loops, I just made myself with my little thing. But let's let's listen to some of the drum kit. I'm just gonna grab the drum kit and solo it. So this is what I sent to Tim for him to mix. I get great mileage out of using this stir sound from the uh, the ballad brushes kit. You can use this in a lot of cues. It just has a nice like white white tone to it. Let me solve this. I'll show you exactly how it sounds. When we sampled this, it was a um, um, Devin, our awesome drummer, who did a lot of sampling back in the old days. He was just stirring the drum, which is a jazz technique, and I asked him to do it without any tempo information. So um, a lot of times when 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 uh, drummers will stir a snare, they'll go one, two, three, four, five, six. So they give away one, two. So you got to add that in to have like a realistic effect. Let's see. I think I added just in little snare hits. So um, there is really no other way to sample doing that. So if you're programming snare drums, that's a good way to do it. So um, again, with this, I have nothing on the on the um, the master track. I I had some things. Uh, I was using the Slade Virtual Tape Machine. Don't get too concerned with um, settings on a lot of this stuff. It looks like I didn't change anything. Look at this input output. 
I just pick the kind of tape. This might even be the default setting. I just put it on to make myself feel better. I don't know if it does anything. But um, it looks like I had some EMT 140 on the bus and it turned it off and you mix. And, and then all I did was um, go in and, and um, bounce each track out for Tim. I find it easier when programming drums. I'm not the ex I'm not the best at doing this to have multiple tracks with one element each. So I split out the the kick because the imagine this the mixer is gonna want to have everything separately um, as if they set up the microphones in a drum kit. And mixers spend a lot of time learning learning drums, how to record drums. It's kind of like their four part chorale writing study. So you want to definitely, um, unless you're completely satisfied with your drum kit, you don't want to give them a stereo drum kit. They can get great sounds out of having the individual elements. And I find it's easier to programming things, um, having playing them, playing them like one element at a time. So it'd just be like the ride cymbal by itself, or like the hi hat by itself, or the snare by itself. Um, this kind of stuff really um, is, is a personal choice, but uh, you could go in and I guess mute each thing and bounce it out a bunch of different times. But um, I've never had, even though I'm a pretty good pianist, I've never had the facility to like make an awesome drum groove. I have to like think about it in my head and, um, and play it like one element at a time. And um, so for the bass, I, I pretty much I think I left him alone. I'm just hope, hopeless with the bass. It's a very hard instrument to, um, look, I didn't put anything on him because I just knew, I, I tried fooling around with some, like, oh, I put a gain plus six. I tried fooling around with some um, bass plugins. You know, I find that's just very difficult. So good luck with all your bass recording. Look, I did, I, <laughs> I'm a genius. I did plus six and then minus five here. Let's see if I did any automation, no automation. So. Um, that's not very good, so I could have just gone minus one. Anyway, so in conclusion, um, the last session I showed you, I also, with my plugins, except for the reverb, um, bounced everything out. It's okay to have a little bit of plugins doing some stuff, and uh, it's okay to commit the mixer your panning. So if you spend a lot of time getting a panoramic picture of left, right, center, um, and then you bounced everything center for your mixer, that wouldn't might make much sense. So you definitely want to do, um, keep some of your hard work in there. And so bounce every individual element out, name them accordingly, and always double check your stems. If you're doing, unless you have a, unless you have a dedicated Pro Tools rig, where each track has an output and then Pro Tools definitely has an each individual element by itself and it's all routed. Because I almost guarantee if you don't check your stems, you're going to make mistakes and you might have something soloed that you didn't do. You might have two things soloed and name them as one. So you want to go in and um, take your stems, open them in a separate session and double check them, especially if you're doing like a final delivery for, for a, um, a really important project. So um, now I'm going to head over to Tim's studio and let's see how, um, how he did uh, his mixing and this is about as far as I could go with, uh, with what I was going to do. Okay, off to part three.